Um, good uh, evening, everybody. Welcome to another Wednesday session or a joint between ORUK and the FRCS Mentor uh, site. Um, today, we are very pleased to uh, present Mr. Mahala Maksimbala. Um, he's a consultant orthopedic surgeon who has both the affiliation with the ORUK and the affiliation with the FRCS Mentor Group since its inception. He, he was a consult, he's a consultant in Prince Alexandria Hospital in Harlow and Ramsey River Hospital. His special interest is in lower limb and uh, joint arthroplasty and revision knee surgery. He's completed his original orthopedic training at the prestigious Royal National Orthopedic Hospital in Stanmore Rotation and has also spent uh, uh, a lot of time as a visiting fellow in well-renowned centres all across North America. He's co-director of the FRCS Ortho Revision course at the Royal College of Surgeons England, which I strongly recommend to anybody that can attend this course, as uh, um, I, I attended it as well, and I thought it was really useful with, with both uh, himself and Mr. Sherman. He's also been invited as a national speaker at international conferences, and he's on a faculty of numerous teaching courses, including in Harlow, Total Knee Replacement course and Cambridge Basic Science course and is a former faculty member at the Combined BOA Basque Instructional Course. With us in the FRCS Mentor Group since inception, I have always enjoyed listening to his talks. Even when I was preparing for my exams, I look forward to, when I knew he was at, at a course, I always look forward to hearing from him. Um, on a personal level, he is an amazing teacher and I'm uh, really proud to present him uh, today. Mr. Mahler Maxwala, it's a pleasure to meet you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shwan. That's very good of you. Uh, can you hear me, Shwan and Hani? And yes, we can. Yeah. And yeah, thanks, Shwan. That was an excellent introduction. Thank you so much. And Hani, thanks for being there. And also to ORUK, to Hannah and uh, Imogen. Uh, so, uh, just to thank everyone, and like I said, I've been involved with ORUK for many years and with the FRC Mentor Group since the inception. The FRCS Mentor Group really, way beyond the pandemic and way beyond Zoom being popular, they were in the forefront of international meetings. And I'm really glad to be part of them with, with Shwan and all, all the mentors who started it. In addition, like Swan shared, I'm, I'm passionate about teaching both the ORUK Vikas Kanduja Cambridge course and, and the FRCS uh, Royal College course, which is uh, me and Mr. Sherman co-host now. Uh, this talk is important and I, Shwan already has done an excellent talk on free body diagram, which is on the YouTube channels. But I thought talking about biomechanics from the surgeon's point of view is always easy to repeat because however much time you repeat it, it's one of the talks where you agree, Hani and Schwann, people don't talk about it in the coffee room, etc. You agree with that. So verbalization of these, this topic, I think is important to repeat. Is that correct for both of you? Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. It's, it's the basis of understanding what we're putting in. in terms and surgeons, yes. Thank you. So the way I'll do the talk is let's talk about, start with free body diagram, talk about offset, talk a bit about THR loosening. And one of the questions which always is an issue, every candidate, every six months or one year, you know, as to which hip to put in, what should I say, what should I not say? So I thought I'll uh, just expand on that. And I put in in the talk that because there's a, this is an excellent format, you know, you have a lecture, then you have a case discussion, and because I was leading onto the case discussion on hips, because I'm a hip surgeon as well, that I thought that the end part of this talk, I will include how to interpret complex hip x-rays. And it's not complex because it's fellowship level. It is you're going to be shown a complex hip x-ray in the exam. There's no doubt about it. You're not expected to know how you'll truly tackle it, but the principles of talking about it are important. Once again, Sean and uh, Hani, do you agree that that point is there, that we are, it's not fellowship level to tackle it, but the interpretation of the x-rays would be expected. Would that be correct, both of you? Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. Accurate interpretation of the x-rays, especially in the yeah. x-rays. Exactly. So however complex it is, we have to talk about it. So that's what I'll end the talk with. And then we go on to 
uh, questions which Tani will uh, ask, and then we'll uh, have the case discussion in the same theme. Okay, so that's the plan for everyone today. So let's start now. Going back to basic biomechanics, what is force? So just tell the examiner there are many definitions of it. You can go through all the textbooks, but when an object is pushed or pulled, a force is applied. Just remember that statement. And remember to tell the examiner that force could be tangential, shear, compressive, et cetera. So that's one. The next thing is, what is weight? So weight is the gravitational force by the earth on object. Can you remember that statement? So what is weight? Weight is a gravitational force by the earth on object. Oh, and um, you're muted? Yeah, you, you, you mute yourself? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So where did I stop? I don't know, where did I? You stopped at force. Okay, so can I start, can I repeat again? Yeah. Please. So, so when an object is pushed or pulled, a force is applied. Yeah, and the force could be tangential, shear, or compressive, okay? And what is weight? So weight is a gravitational force by the earth on object. So tell the examiner that I'm going to commence by knowing what is weight. So weight is the gravitational force by the earth on object, and the magnitude of that would be in Newtons. And the way I get that would be the mass of that. So if a human being is 100 kilograms into 9.8 meters, and that gives you the Newtons. You okay, just remember that part. So moving on. What is moment? So just a simple definition of moment is the bending action about a point. Okay, so the bending action about a point is a moment. And remember, that it is different from a true lever. Okay, so the, what, what I'd like to tell you is start by telling the examiner, I do know what a moment is, and a moment is the bending action about a point. Now, that is a bit different from torque, which is a rotary action about a point. But the point, the, the important issue is start telling the examiner when you're drawing a free body diagram that I'm selecting my point. So the point I select is center of the femoral head, the center of the, of the ankle, et cetera. And then say the moment which I want to talk about is the bending action about that point, which is the center of my femoral head. So moving on, what is the moment arm? So moment arm, and this is again a repetitive, but I'm just repeating again. It's the perpendicular distance from the line of action of the force. So this is the line of action of the force. This is the perpendicular distance, and that's your moment arm. Okay, that's the next statement, which I, which all of you all know, but I, I would like you to uh, say that again. Moving on, what is the moment, therefore, is the force into the perpendicular di distance. So the force we need to know, and the perpendicular distance in the point, and that gives you the moment. Now, direction of moment is something which every one of you all will argue with your colleagues as to what is the direction of moment. One book will say this, one book will say the other. The best way to remember this is it's the right hand thumbs up rule. So you put your hand, yeah, everyone, can you, can anyone uh, see me now? Can you see my hand, uh, Shwan? Yeah. Yeah, Shwan? Yes, we see it. Yeah, yeah. And if you put your right hand and you put it a thumbs up, your direction of finger, as you agree, is anti-clockwise. So anti-clockwise is positive. Okay, that's one physical way of knowing. And I got this from a physics book. So, so the anti-clockwise is positive. Just remember that. So moving on, verbalize to the examiner that I do know and I want to know when I'm drawing you my free body diagram that I need to know the magnitude of my force, and that is the length. So tell the examiner, the magnitude of my force is the length of the arrow which I'm drawing. Then say, I need to know the line of action. Now remember one word, either use the word line of action or use the word line of orientation. So that could be either vertical, it could be, hor it could be horizontal, it could be vertical, it could be oblique. So that's your line of action. And the third thing, tell the examiner, I will draw the arrow, which gives me my sense for the direction. 
So the three statements, when you start drawing the first arrow, is the magnitude is the length, the orientation is the angle, and the third is the direction, which is assessed. And then say that we can now calculate forces by drawing to scale, which is the tip to tail method. So that's your next statement. And then say, I do know that I want to introduce a topic called couple. And what is a couple? A couple is a pair of forces, but with opposite direction. And I do know the resultant force of a couple is zero. So just going back again, this is the statement which I want you to give for drawing any free diagram, whether it's the hip, the ankle, the spine, is using these correct these words, which is magnitude, orientation, and sense, saying that I will calculate it by tip to tail method, then saying I need to know what is a couple that a pair of forces with opposite sense and the resultant of that force is zero. So moving on, we have the attachment of muscles. So can everyone see this? Yeah. So this is your attachment of your abductors. Do you agree at this? So do you agree this is the magnitude, which is the length? Do you agree that this is the body weight, correct? And this is the resultant force of the hip. Now, one of the statements which always confuses, I mean, I ask or Shwan or Hani when they are when we are vibrating, everyone puts the arrow or the sense down to the weight because that's no confusion. Do you agree? But when we draw the abductors, the abductor arrow is downwards. And some people put it upwards. I can't understand why we are putting it downwards. And the best way of explaining this is that imagine, and I, once again, Shwan, just see whether you can see my hands above me. So imagine that as a person, I'm in the middle of the femoral head, okay? And I'm trying to get my head out from the femoral head. So, and the right hand pulling down is your weight, okay? Now imagine, if there was no force pulling this way, do you agree that if this pulled down, I would just stumble across and go spinning, spinning, spinning? So the way the body is, up, is going to neutralize that is that's the reason why this is downwards and the abductor pull has to be in the same direction. And you as the head inside is coming out, you know, trying to get out through the head and that's your result in force. So that's the best way I can explain it rather than trying to argue with people as to why the arrow is down rather than up. Okay, so this is just one simple way, but remember the arrowhead of both is going to be downwards. And the resultant force of course is here. And so once again, when you're telling the examiner, tell him I'm going to draw your free body diagram. This is my, I've, I've picked the center of the femoral head. This is the weight downwards. This is the abductor force. And then moving on, you have to ask the questions. What are the common questions? What is the joint reaction force in the hip? In single stance, cane in the opposite hand. Other question is, tell me what happens when you swing your body over the affected hip and tell me what happened in Trendle. Do you agree five questions are the common ones asked? I don't have time to do all, but I'll just tell you how I want you to verbalize straightforward and simply as to what we do. Tell me the joint reaction force on the hip in single stance, which is the common one asked. So for that, tell the examiner, and verbalize that I do know that this is my magnitude and the arrow of pointing downwards. Can you see? Yeah, that's your, and that's five sixth body weight. And that's when someone is standing on the left lower limb, right? So that's downwards. Then say, when in equilibrium, the known clockwise moments, you agree that this is clockwise and you agree by my convention of the, of the thumbs up rule, you agree it's minus everyone. That's what I, we had said. My, this, clockwise moment, which is downwards, has to be balanced by the unknown anti-clockwise moment, which is here, around the center of the femoral head. Therefore, the first thing I want to know is what is the abductor muscle force? So the way I get that is I do know that A is five centimeters, we've got that. We know B is 15 centimeters, so that's our, we know the distances. We know and tell the examiner the forces over the couple is zero. And therefore, this force, which at the moment is unknown to me, you agree? This is unknown to me at the moment. Force into A, which is this, that's five, plus. Remember, we agree that coming down 
is minus for the body weight into B, which I know this level is zero. And by the calculation, I get 2.5 body weight is my abductor force. And that's the direction of my arrow. Do you agree, everyone? Now I want to know what is my joint reaction force. Now I know that this arrow downwards is five, six body weights. I know this arrow in this angle and with the arrow down is 2.5 body weight. So therefore, when I do my tip to tail method, we agree this was 2.5 in this direction down, 5.6 there, and therefore the joint reaction force is 3.3. I believe that everyone gets confused because without knowing the abductors, they try to get this diagram. What I'm trying to say is that you need to get to the force abductor first, which is on this slide, right? You have to get my abductor force first, and then you get the joint reaction force. So that's the simpler way of explaining it in the exam. So let's move on. Now we can just talk as to what is good, right? So we agree that if your body weight, which is down, is less, do you agree that's good for joint reaction force? That's one answer you the examiner. Do you agree now coming to distances? Remember we said that C, remember C, which is the distance from the head to your abductor force. Imagine that is small, right? Which is Cox of Alga, everyone agrees. You agree that is small and that's bad. So you get a worse for your joint reaction force. And the last thing is B is good. The closer the center of gravity is to the B, a center of rotation, it's better. So therefore, this is the basic principle. And I want you to verbalize it, examiner, of the Trendelberg test or when you put your body across the same side. You're getting this line closer, which is B is becoming smaller. So happy with that, everyone? So that, that is what, in a simple way, rather than trying to read many books, is what we get from joint reaction force. Why is this important as a surgeon? Because this talk is a surgeon's perspective. So, so far, maybe I think I was about 12 or 13 minutes. Uh, is that right, Sean? How many minutes have passed? Uh, just about that. Yeah. yeah. So 12 or 13 minutes was unfortunate. I use the word unfortunately because this is not something we trained as surgeons to do. We didn't, I didn't open up hips. To just I wanted to hammer in hips and knees. But we needed to know this. It's important. And now why? So... When we talk about the question is what happens to joint reaction force in gait, running, stumbling, bed rest? And whenever I ask this question or Hani or Shuan ask this question, everyone will give an answer that it's five times body weight, it's seven times body weight. But what we want to seek in the viva is your higher order thinking. That what do you truly understand by eight times body weight? What, what is it worse than two times body weight? So that answer is that these are the figures. Yeah, we all know these figures. Slow walking is three times body weight. Fast walking is seven times body weight. If you're stumbling, you get eight times body weight. What does it mean? This means that if you're a 100 kilo man, and this is why the first statement I made was important. If you're talking about eight times body weight, it is 100, which is your kilo, remember, into your mass, which is your body weight, and eight times of that, but we have to add in your 9.8 meters to get your answer in Newtons. And that's 8,000 Newtons, which is a huge amount of magnitude of a force applied. And just so you know, femoral neck fractures happen at about 9,000. So stumbling can truly cause the magnitude of your Newtons to be so high. So I hope once again, I made it very clear and simple that what it means by body weight. Yeah, rather than just saying three times, five times, seven times. So this clearly gives you as to what it means. Now, let's go into something interesting, which we are surgeons and we want to bang in our hips and knees. So what is offset? So offset is the distance between the long axis of the femur and the center of rotation of your hip. And this could be your virgin hip or could be your joint replacement. Hip. Okay, so, but that's what I want to recreate is my offset and tell the examiner that I do know offset is important and it changes with what? It changes with neck length, yeah? So you can change neck length and how do you influence neck length? That's very simple. Use a plus five head, use a zero head or a minus five head, okay? So that's neck length. But it's also important that your offset changes with neck angle. So if you change your neck shaft angle, you have a change in offset. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now the average offset, in the world 
is could be anything, it could be 40, et cetera. And the range is from 27 to 70, 57. So please don't accept there's a wide range. And the statement, which is very important to remember, is a varus neck shaft angle. Varus. So if you're in varus, you have an increased offset. So keep that as gold standard of what I'm saying. So varus neck shaft angle, you have an increased offset. And if you have a valgus neck shaft angle, you have a decreased offset. Okay. So next question to the examiner or the examiner asks, or when you're talking, if, you, if you're given an implant and you're holding it in your hand, start talking about offset. And then say, I do know offset is important because, and everybody gets confused as to why you need correct offset. The best answer is I feel, say that I want to recreate correct offset of that patient, or I want to increase or slightly increase offset is optimal because I want the best lever arm ratio. So I hope all of you are happy to make this first statement. And why I want that is that it's there to optimize my tension of the abductors. So if I have my correct offset, I get a correct optimum tension of my abductors. And that indirectly increases my stability of my soft tissues and it directly causes less impingement. So once again, every I ask everyone, why do you want correct offset? And the answer is, is there, but clearly I want correct or increased offset is optimal. It's the best lever arm ratio. It gives me my best tension of my abductors. It increases my stability of my soft tissues and I get less impingement. Okay, so four points, you know the words, let it come out. And then what can I do to get my offset better? Remember we said, the correct neck off and correct neck shaft angle or varus will give you my better offset and that's optimal and better offset is you can get this offset so you can increase offset without increasing neck length which indirectly for me as a hip surgeon means what that i can get better abductor tensioning i can get better stability but i don't change the length of that limb right i don't want to make the patient long so you get that by influencing your offset by changing into varus. So that leads us to what is your normal neck angle? So coxavera is a neck angle, which is 125. And as you go more into valgus, you're into higher 125. And the neck shaft, if you look at measurements of the world population, the average I'm telling you is 128. But do you agree that DHSs are 135, uh, exit the hip, Charnley hips are all 135. Do you agree with that answer? I mean, it is. You have other options, but the general answer is 135. So whenever I ask is, why did this happen? You know, why is it 135 when truly we know in the world that all our hips are probably at 128? And the answer to that is this, that remember we said that best offset or various inflowing offset is good because we get it's good for abductor function because you have a good offset. But, and these are the three words which those giving the exam next week or any time going to say that increased offset, however, unfortunately, will increase three words bending moments in the proximal femur. So please remember that. Okay. So that's what happens. And that bending moments in the proximal femur is worse when you're getting up from the chair or from stair climb. Now in the past, when because of this increased bending moments in the proximal femur and metallurgy was not good, when we had various stems which were angled at say 125, 128, you got what is called a stem breakage. So that used to happen, metal break, that used to have stem failure. We don't get that now with our new exeters, new CPTs, but that was the reason why we opted for a little more valgus but for you at the basic science level, that's the fundamental reason. And therefore the opposite of that is a valgus hip position is not really very good for best abductor function, but it does decrease the bending moments of the proximal femur. So the paradox is increased movement during weight bearing, you get, and where do you get it? Now, this is once again, I know Schwan and Hani asked these questions that if you're doing a cemented hip, where is the maximum strain? So this indirectly is telling you that the strain is within the stem and the tip, that's one, and the increased strain on the medial cement mantle. So that's the reason why now you know that I want the best cementing there and I want the best cementing here. Yeah, so indirectly we're covering another topic 
as to where we want our best cement in. And therefore, this could potentially lead to increased loosening and fracture, which I said doesn't happen now. So that was one concept. So what have we covered so far? We've covered joint reaction force for stumbling, falling fractures. We've covered the importance of true offset. We've covered how offset is influenced by neck length and changing your angle. We also covered why or where the bending moments are the most and where you should try to avoid having the Having, having the best cement or where it will fail, right? So we've covered that. Now we're going to a little next topic. Imagine you're giving an implant to hold as how do I want as a surgeon my best implant? So the word you'll want to use is I want my implant to be not dramatically stiff because the increased stripping is detrimental. Yes, because you'll have more, what is the word I wanted to use, which all of you will say that increased stiffness of that implant or the metal will cause stress shielding, which I don't particularly want. Tell the examiner, all modern implants will not have sharp notches and sharp corners because that's detrimental and you'll have increased stresses. So they'll have a sex next thing. And say that most of the modern hips, like the Exeter or the CPTs will be in the vicinity of about 150 millimeters. So when you open your box and you're doing your timeout in your WHO checklist, all of them will say 150. Now, why is it 150? Why is it not five millimeters? Why is it not 550 millimeters? So for that, introduce the concept to your examiner that I do know that every implant is divided into three parts. It's the proximal and the distal. The proximal and the distal are called the load transfer regions. And the middle is called the load sharing region. And hence say, it's important for me to have that and therefore high the percentage of the load carried by the stem in the middle region, more loaded transfer distally with it detrimental. So therefore you don't want too stiff an implant. So what is, the, what is exactly stress shielding? I find this is the simplest definition. Higher the percentage of load carried by the stem in the middle region, more loaded transfer distally, which is detrimental. Okay, that's where we are. And the long, if people ask, why don't you use a longer stem? That's not better. All you're doing is, you know, separating the proximal and distal regions. And theoretically, and I use the word theoretically because once again, I'm a hip surgeon, the collars are meant to transfer load proximally. Whether it truly happens or not is not there, but that is the basis of your collar, all right? So for transfer, remember three parts of the stem, you don't want increased stiffness and you don't want sharp corners. And in the end, therefore, we go to a fully coated implant. Why is it good? It's good because you get initial rigid fixation, which is advantages. So tell the examiner, this is, imagine you're given an uncemented stem in your hand to talk about. You'll say, yes, it is completely fully coated. The advantage would be initial rigid fixation. However, I do know that this may have an increased spot well and an increased stress shielding, which is detrimental. And then imagine you're given the next implant, which is your uncemented stem, which is a proximal coated. In that you'll say, this is a proximal coated uncemented stem. It has more of a physiological load transfer and theoretically less stress shielding. And, but there may be an initial less rigid fixation. All right, so that's, I'm just giving in brief, this is where we are with uncemented stems. So, so just to recap, now we are coming to the difficult question where everyone asks that, you know, what is your ideal hip or which hip will you use? And everyone gets a little scared and say, oh, they failed me because I know he's a cemented user and I use a coriola, I said this and I said that. Look, it doesn't matter. You can use whatever hip you want, but you need to justify it by a particular manner. So this is the way I think you can talk about hip. The first thing you say is, and because you're joining me as a consultant, uh, say that I will use a generic, you'll use the name. I'll use a brand name, which is an Exeter cemented or an uncemented Trident cup. Say that. And then don't stop there. You have to immediately say that the reason I say this is this system is the system I want to use is because I want a system which reproduces the normal anatomy of a patient. So make that statement as your first statement. 
and then say, I do know I will be tackling patients with different anatomic variants. Therefore, I want a complete system, which is that got an inventory for all my anatomical variants. That's your basis of which system you use. Then say, I need a robust planning or templating kit, which I can reproduce that patient's anatomy. That's important. And then say, I want to reproduce the three most important things of a hip replacement, which is recreating my hip center. So I want that statement to be made. And I get that by a hip system, like the Exeter or whichever you want to use, you can say Coral, you can Charlie, it makes no difference. It reproduces offset, it reproduces neck length, and it reproduces neck angle. And then say, I want a hip system which has all the variability of an optimal head neck ratio. Happy to use that word, I'm introducing that. Then say, I need a system which has an initial stable fixation with ongoing lifelong fixation. And then say, therefore, I use whichever of your ODEP 10 ratings, which got this paper, which shows a 15 year survival. So this is where your survival comes in. You're, you're, you're justifying that with NICE and with ODEP. And then say, I do know the stiffness is such that it is optimal and the peak stresses are reduced. Then say, I want a system which has the best flexible bearing surfaces. Therefore, don't get bogged down by, oh, I use ceramic for everyone, or everyone tells you in the exam, say ceramic because otherwise you're going to trouble. Everyone says ceramic on poly It's Forget about it. You are all consultant colleagues in real life. I want a system which has a flexibility of all bearing surfaces. And in true life in the UK, I will make that decision on cost. And therefore, it's a long term track record, it's non experimental. And, it, and then you can add educational support and excellent support, okay? So this is, but the basics is I use an implant because of these fundamental reasons, which are your biomechanical reasons. So, Shuan and Hani, how many minutes do I have now? I'm coming to the end. Is it 25 or? Yeah. I think we, ha we have more 10 minutes. 10 more minutes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. So we got 10 more minutes. Is that correct? Yes. No, no. I'm, I'm happy for you to, uh, for you, you to continue. I'm, I find, I know that the candidates all find this uh, talk very useful. So please do continue. Don't worry about the time. Okay. Thank you. So, so that was your that was my first part. So not to confuse anyone, it's it, the first part of the talk was unfortunately the biomechanics, and I hope I made it a little more interesting as to why we do it as a surgeon. Okay, so we, this is the first part. The second part is how to talk regarding a difficult hip management in the uh, exam. So the first thing is, imagine this is shown to you, uh, and you all agree that on this X-ray. Uh, the first thing that will strike you is that it's not a straightforward hip, okay? It's not a straightforward hip you take on. And in your mind, you all agree that this would probably come on the realms of a complex hip, right? I'll keep the true description, right, of how we describe the hip uh, just towards the end. But I want to point out first as to what we will say when we come across and why it is complex and how we will manage this. So the, what I would like you to say in the exam, once you've described the x-ray in the manner which I will come to in the case discussion, okay? Once you know it is complex, you're gonna finish by saying, yes, this is this, I see this, 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 this. And then the exam is gonna ask you, how will you tackle this? Now in your mind, do you agree? And I'll go back again. Do you agree there's a degree of complexity to it? We talk about why, but it's not straightforward. And one of the things that I wanted to tell you, everyone, is don't ask the examiner that does the patient have pain, has the patient has infection, has the patient had a stick, has the patient, don't ask that. And don't even say that I will examine the patient and do a neurovascular deficit and run through points which are not truly relevant as a consultant colleague talking to you. But you can't you can't go over the fact that you have to history and examine the patients. The best way of tackling these difficult uh, situations is start by making a statement, which is assuming that I've taken a history, a complete history, 
and I've completely examined the patient and conservative measures have been exhausted and I, there's no true contraindication to joint replacement surgery, which is a recent MI or stroke. And there's no issue of culminating infection. This patient is a candidate for staged complex bilateral hip replacement. Okay, so that you have to use those words. There's no doubt rubbing around the bush and saying, I'll give him a stick, I'll give him a physio. Please don't do all that, okay? Say that, assuming that all these have been exhausted, this is what I'll do. And then say, it is complex surgery. So now my realm of my talk, before I come on to X-ray interpretation, is why did I feel it's complex? Or why should anyone feel it's complex? So for me as a hip surgeon, the complexity is divided into four points. So one is, am I going to struggle with my exposure? Because that's exposure. And that would include the true pathology of the hip, which will make me struggle, but also, where there's previous scarring, if she's had four surgeries, five surgeries previously. Also, if the patient's obese. If the patient's obese, in my opinion, it comes under complex primary. And when I book my patients, it's very clear. It could be an obese patient. My bookers know that I've written down very clearly it's complex primary with a 1.5 hour slot. So keep that in mind. So exposure is one. Second, is will I struggle or will I have difficulty in getting my hip center restoration? So this is the second word which I wanted to use when you're talking about any x-ray in the exam, either on Monday or for the people giving it next time. So will I get my hip center restoration? Third is to say, I want to know whether there's any complexity on my femoral side. For example, is there a screw in place which I can't get my coral down? Is there ostomy in place that I can't do, right? So that's your femoral side. And then on your acetabular side, for example, is there any destructive lesion, et cetera. So just let go each of them in more detail. The aim exposure is I want to get an exposure and discrete safely. So like I said, obesity and previous scarring is your soft tissue dissection to get into. And on the true hip side, I feel that three hips which I challenge me. You agree it's protusio, the tele examiner, this is a protusio, therefore it's a challenge of exposure. There's an ankylosis, therefore you know it's stiff and you cannot dislocate. And third is a coxa magna, which is a large head. You don't know where to end, you don't know where to begin. So your dislocation. So, so these are the only three entities where you struggle with exposure. So that's your one big heading where it is complex. The second big heading, which is complex, is how will I get my hip center restoration? So this is in your DDHs or any hip which got a destructive superior lip. So tell the examiner, my aim is to get my hip center correct. And with that, I want to ask myself, will there be a nerve problem? So am I really distalizing everything? And will I get it with just a soft tissue and getting my cup where it is? Or is it so high that I will need resection of both? Okay, that's your question on your hip center restoration. Then I ask myself, on my femur, right, what are my problems? So one is, is the canal patent? If it's not patent, well, it's going to be difficult. Second, is there any metal work there, which I'm going to remove at the same sitting? Or is it a metal work put in when that patient was three years old and now the patient's 75? Okay, it's going to be a struggle to remove that one screw, which is going to come in the way of your hip. Third, is there a deformity? Did the patient have a previous osteotomy? And if these, that's all I'm bothered about. And can I get my stem down? And therefore, that gives me the answer in your management that will I have to do the same sitting metal of removal, later date metal of removal? Do I have to do osteotomy, same sitting or later? And do I use a short stem? So that's all will be on the principles of management. And moving on onto the acetabular side, what is my worry? My first worry is, can I get my cup down? As you know, when you're doing your MDTs for hip, uh, all of us hip arthroplasty surgeons, the question is, have I got my hip inferiorized, my cup inferiorized? So in other words, what is the word which I wanted to use is, can I localize the roof floor? Second, is once I've inferiorized my cup and localized it through four and put my cup where I wanted to put, is there going to be an uncontained effect superiorly? And is that large enough to need what? Will it need impaction bone grafting? Will it need an augment? Will it need a structural bone graft? So these are three words I've used. 
which are all which you need to know that once I get my cup in the true floor, then is the uncontained defect superiorly? How am I going to tackle that? And the three ways of tackling it would be impaction bone grafting, structural bone grafting, or uh, augment. And then I divide my mind. So this is what I think in my mind on the acetabular side is superior problem. And then I this the more difficult ones are what is happening in the true acetabulum, you know, in the floor area. So that is protusio and how far medial has it gone? And last question, I look at the x-rays. You don't need CTs, okay? Hip arthroplasty surgeons, we get a lot of information from x-rays, but every time I ask a question register, the first thing they say is, I want a CT. You don't need a CT. You need to interpret plain x-rays. And for that, the last thing is, is the column and the walls intact? So the anterior column and posterior wall intact. And therefore I finish with this X-ray, that if this X-ray is put to you, how are we gonna talk about it? And the first, and therefore, uh, so Shwan and Hani, if you don't mind, uh, what, are, what is my time? Um, okay, we are um, officially over time. Um, however, yeah. as I said, I'm very happy for you to continue. Yeah. No, what I was wondering is that I will like to stop here. The reason is I'll, I'll come back to that in passive case discussion. Okay, so I'll finish the talk now because it'll be a nice, because I've said what I've said, it covers what I wanted to say in the talk, John and Honey, and then this will be a good one to start on the, if anyone wants to start the discussion with me, yeah? Any of the candidates. That's pretty So good. I'll end with that. Thank you again. I hope I've been as clear as I can in about 35 minutes on a very big topic, but I think it's such a topic that verbalization and words coming out are important. And uh, the, this is the book, which is the, OR, uh, the FRCS Mentor Group's book. And as well, we have the OR UK's books. So we'll keep, and again, this is the donation to OR UK and which is a charitable organization. And like I said, it's fantastic for, uh, for teaching the UK. So thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Hani, are there any questions? Uh, no, no questions so far. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. I, I have a question, if that's okay, Mr. Max Morel. Um, why is it so important to have your offset uh, correct? What What is the advantage, mechanical advantage? I think the mechanical advantage one would be that, like I said, if your offset is key to getting your center of rotation has to be right. And if your center of rotation is right, your offset will follow depending on your implant, right? When you do a hip replacement. And that's the difference between a virgin hip and we doing a hip replacement that we may put our cup perfectly. But then if we put our cup perfectly with a perfect center of rotation where it's meant to be, we need the head and the neck to be in that center of rotation. And we get that by only getting that offset right. Now, if we didn't get that offset right, let's say we got the offset wrong by either a combination of the neck length not being right, which is a common one people try to influence, or we get it by truly not using the implant choice to us, because all systems will have a varied level of implant choice. You know, you'll have a low offset, you'll have a cox of error stem, you'll have a high offset, you'll have a very high offset. So these options are given to you. And if we get that right, then the abduct, the word I would say, therefore, is by getting the correct offset, which truly means the center of rotation is correct, I recreate and get the best abductor tension. And the abductor tension is key to the hip stability, impingement, limp, and outcome, right? Absolutely. And the fourth is that what, what I try to push on is that when I do a corral or when I do uncemented, I do sometimes change my offset by actually using the coxavera stem. So I practically do it in real life, right? Because I don't want to lengthen. The mistake people make is they want to get the tension and they lengthen the limb. And especially uncemented, I see so many hips which are kept long, right? That's, that's not right. So this is where, thanks for the question, because that's where offset is so important. 
absolutely. Um, the uh, the when you talk about in terms of absolutely everything there is correct, but even more basic than that is an efficient abductor means that the joint reaction force across your uh, prosthesis is minimal yeah. because the abductor doesn't need to work so hard. To, absolutely. Uh, thing. So therefore, you're also as well as all the other things which are extremely important and far more important than this, but that means your polyware is less or yeah, your yeah. top is less as well because of decreased joint reaction force. Long-term survival. Hassan, thank you for that. In fact, that's uh, a point which is without a doubt that your long-term survival will depend on joint reaction force being optimal, which happens only with correct abductor tension. Thanks for that, John. Perfect. Okay. So uh, another question. Uh, so in other DDH uh, for total hip replacement, do you prefer to use a small or large cup? Uh, uh, Hani, if you don't mind, uh, when someone asked this, I think they were asking a very valid question is that there's a word called jumbo cups, which, you know, people, yeah. I, I guess this question is, will you put in a jumbo cup? In other words, would you put in a cup, which is, you know, more. The answer is in modern hip replacement surgery, I believe that you need to get your center of rotation perfect, which means the answer, direct answer to this question is no. You need to get your cup perfectly positioned with the correct size cup and that defect filled up with organ. So it's easier to put a larger cup. It's easier to do a jumbo cup, but the answer is no. And if you don't mind, Hani, when I go through some slides that will become clear for example this one which is on the screen yeah. it's, it, it, it's not true it's not at all displaced but I, we need to tackle that you know? so we'll talk about that but the direct answer is no i i don't think we should use large cups or jumbo cups we need to get that hip center correct okay so in in case of long standing uh coxa valga mm -hmm. it is easy to increase the offset without any release any soft tissue release is that one of the questions? Yes. Yeah, I would say even for that, uh, I would say, I think Hani and Shwani will agree that these questions are more pertinent to fellowship level discussions. And I don't think because Shwan and Hani, we are very particular that we want this to be true FRCS based questions and, and answers. I can give the answer and the answer is no, the soft tissue release will, I really don't do so. You, 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 you get everything right and see where you are, but this will not be a pass or fail and won't be particularly asked. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Yes, yeah. absolutely. This is uh, beyond FRCS and it's more highly specialized fellowship level. Uh, yeah. Please try and keep it towards the FRCS. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'll encourage these questions, but if they are like this, don't worry. If you ask this question, it means you've already come to the level of your seven because you've answered the remaining things correct. Is that a good way of telling this question? It's a good question, but you've already passed with a seven if you're coming to this level. Hmm? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And to be honest with you, I don't expect them. You, uh, I don't think they expect you to answer it. They're just trying desperately to find where your limited knowledge is. Correct. Okay, yeah. There is no more questions. Okay. So in that case, uh, uh, if we have about fifteen minutes, on uh, uh, is there anyone who would like to just volunteer on how? Yes. To Ask about this? Yes, we have Mehdi Sozingar. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. a first volunteer for a, for a case discussion. Yeah, fine. Mehdi, would you, would you mind unmute yourself, Mehdi? Yep. <clears throat> Hi. Hi, Mehdi. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Thank Hi. you. Yeah, thank you, Mehdi. Thank you very much. And don't worry, this is this part of the session, what all of us have developed, Hannah, Imogen, all the work is nothing to do with your skills or your knowledge of FRCO. It's just to initiate a discussion, if you don't mind, maybe. All right. So the Viva will be later for the hot seat. Yeah? So just imagine this is your adult reconstruction Viva, and or you're sitting with me as a you know as a fellowship, or you've gone to the states or any center for a fellowship, and this X-ray is put in front of you. Just tell me about this X-ray. How will you start? You know? <clears throat> um, I would start by saying that this is a uh, AP radiograph of uh, the pelvis uh, centered on the um, uh, symphysis pubis. 
um, showing mm -hmm. significant uh, degenerative changes with uh, <clears throat> uh, significant bone loss in both of the femora heads. Uh, the acetabulum mm -hmm. is um, uh, dysplastic on both sides. Um, mm -hmm. I cannot appreciate any deformities in the femur or uh, mm -hmm. the hemipelvises are um, more or less equal uh, and the, there's not much rotation in this um, uh, film. So okay. Very um, good. I'm suspecting, um, I want to know whether there is a past history of, um, uh, it would be useful to know whether there is a past history of um, a paraphase disease or a DDH or infection. Mm -hmm. in this case, and uh, I would like to evaluate this patient uh, clinically and um, take a detailed history and examine. Mm -hmm. Lovely, very good. Uh, Meli, so that's excellent. So if I just, you can stay on the screen, but because this is still part of the talk or teaching, uh, Meli, so everyone, for everyone who comes, the first thing to say, Meli, I'm very impressed. The first thing I want everyone to know is that if it's a pelvic x-ray or it's a knee x-ray or shoulder x-ray or ankle x-ray, if you look at uh, our uh, FRCS mentor book, there are a number of views which are truly described, which are the correct views for that particular pathology. So for example, as an arthroplasty surgeon, I want you to start by saying this is a pelvis with both hips x-rays centered over the symphysis pubis is what you want, right? Now, Mary and others, if imagine you saw an x-ray of the pelvis, which was adult reconstruction, but with your entire, if your eli crests were also seen, do you agree that was not an arthroplasty x-ray, Mary? Yeah? Yes, yeah, that's for trauma. <clears throat> that's for trauma. So I want that clearly put to you that this is a cor correct x-ray. So example, if you have a knee, talk about a correct knee, if you have a shoulder, say it's an AP view or a valpo view or whatever view you want, say, and if it's not correct, use the word attempted view. Okay, so that's the first statement I want you to make. Yeah, so it's an attempted pelvis with both hips. However, I'm not happy it's not center of the business pubis. So that's the first statement. Next, uh, Mary, while you're there, what else do you want it to be a perfect x-ray? You can say the optator foramen are spherical. Yeah. I know you came to it later on, but in your talk, let it be first. Yeah, I know you came to it later, but let it be first. So, and... You want to say the symphysis pubis and the coccyx are in the same line, so there's no rotation there. So three points for x-ray. It's a pelvis with both hips centered over the symphysis pubis. I'm happy with that the uh, optior foramen are, are central on both sides and the, and the symphysis pubis and the coccyx are in a straight line. Now, in my next statement, I'm very glad with what you said. So, Mehdi, you said, what is the word you use? Bilateral. Just repeat the word. Destruct. What did you say? Destructive. Uh, I, I, I can't remember what exactly I said, but I think I said bilateral, severe, yeah. um, destructive, destructive arthritis in the joint. Exactly. So for everyone in the hip or any other pathology, the first thing I want all of you to say is say what did you see barn straight away. So if you're seeing significant arthritis, use the word, I see bilateral significant destructive arthropathy. So now the word, is that happy with the word destructive arthropathy means automatically you're joining my club of orthopedic surgeons and consultants to speak correctly, right? So the destructive arthropathy, if something is bando as a diagnosis, now do you agree there's no bando in this? You know, it's not perthes, it's not DDH, it's not this, it's not that. So then don't say anything. But imagine if it was a bando perthes, then you agree maybe at this stage of the consultant level talking, you'll say it is perthes. Don't way down the line, yeah? But the first thing you'll say is striking you is destructive arthropathy of both hips. Next, I would say, maybe for every hip, why don't you just straight away say that I noticed there's definite superior migration of both hips. Are you happy to make that statement? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, yes. you're, so you're, in other words, you're saying directly that there's a superior migration and my center of rotation is changed. Happy with that statement? Because that's the first thing which strikes me, right? So there's superior migration exactly. of both the femur and, and the center of rotation has changed. So this is a statement I want everyone to use for all interpretation of x-rays. And next, I want you to divide your mind into the femur and the uh, acetabulum, right? So for the femur, if you don't mind, uh, 
how many do we have for this session, Hani? There's what, three, three volunteers, probably? Uh, we, we, have have another, an, we have another volunteer. Okay, but in that case, let me just carry on with Mehdi for a few more. Okay. And I'll explain this. So yeah. Mehdi, and for everyone, when I start talking on the femoral side, right? Start, you jumped straight away into destructive arthropathy. And then you went and said straight away, there's no issue in the canal, right? And you said the femur appears satisfactory, right? There's no, uh, so. yeah. but there's a lot more you want, to, I want you all to talk about in the head. So the first thing you'll say in the head is describe the head. And for this, I will say that is near, the word I would use, is near complete obliteration of the head. Are you happy with that, Mary? There's no head, right? Yeah, yeah. there's near complete obliteration of the head. Then you're going to say there are definite cysts in the head, right? So you're talking about the head. Now, in the head, after you finished your destruction, uh, the word you're using is complete or near destruction of the femoral head. What are the other options, Mary? If you didn't have this head, you could have a head which has maintained its pericity. That's your most common hip. You get my point? Yeah. Yeah. So imagine, yes, so this is, imagine uh, if you're shown a barn door hip arthritis, which we do day in and day out. Do you agree in that? If you're asked to describe it, you're going to say the sphericity of the head is maintained. Do you agree? Correct. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. But in this one, you're going to say there's near destruction of the femoral head. So what is the third option, the head, which potentially you can see? You will see a head which is misshapen. You agree? It's got a misshapen head. I have to use that word. That's the third word which everyone should use, that you have a misshapen head. The fourth, you agree, you'll have a large head, which you get in Perthes or Coxa Magna. You happy with that, Mary? Yeah, so you'll get a Coxa Magna. That's your fourth type of head. And that's all you'll get, yeah? And the last one, if you really want to be slick, is sometimes we see a portion of the head which is collapsed, and we call that sectoral collapse, you know? Sometimes you see a head which is nice and round, but just the corner here, superior lateral corner is a defect, you agree? And that we call the, so this is there. So now, honey, I'm happy. And then we go on to the neck. So in the neck, I want you to say that I would expect that you will say that the neck is shortened. You agree it's foreshortened, it's a shorter neck than normal, right? So you'll say there's a foreshortened neck, however, the valgus and varus is maintained. So it's not particularly in valgus or varus. I want you to talk about that. And then say, in the intertrochantric and the subtrochantric area, I do not see any evidence of an osteotomy. I do not see any evidence of a previous metalwork or a tract of metalwork removal. So that's all you're going to see in that area. What are the three things, Mary? Repeat again. I, in the trochantric, repeat for me. In the... So you see... Uh, in the subtrochantric or peritrochantric region, there's no sign of a previous uh, operation or osteotomy or any metalwork or metalwork or any deformity or a deformity or a tract of metalwork removal. You know, I want to think like that. So deformity in your words, the words you're going to verbalize is osteotomy, previous osteotomy, previous metalwork and a tract of metalwork removal, right? And last say that the canal is patent. Yeah. And the canal appears patent. Happy with that? And then yep. finish by saying, Mehdi, on this particular radiograph, I cannot see and I, I expect that their patient not had any trauma, but if there is any evidence of a femur trauma, I want a full length femur. You're going to make that statement, right? So this gives me higher order thinking. Okay, that's fine, Mehdi, very well done. So can we move to the next one? Sorry, what, what's the time? Do I have five minutes more? Uh, yeah, you have, definitely. Yeah, okay. So the second one is uh, Mitwali, Mitwali Said. Okay. Would you unmute yourself, Mitwali, please? Yes, honey. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So Mitwali, imagine your, uh, you finished your femoral side, and thank you for once again. I'm not test. It's not a testing of your exam knowledge. Just to initiate a discussion, Mitwali. So now imagine you finished the femoral side, and now say. On the acetabular side, and what will you talk on the acetabular side? So tell me what you'll talk there, Metwali. So on the acetabular side. Uh, I see the, uh, the uh, most acetabulum looks displaced with superior migration of the femoral head. This yeah. uh, superior erosion of the uh, of the upper part of the uh, acetabulum. I can say this is hard to fill type one. The head is still inside the acetabulum with superior migration. Okay. Um, 
good very nice this bro this bro broken 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 chenton line on both sides mm -hmm. what does that uh, give you, you said that what does that mean to you this means the hip center is migrated superiorly in relation to the teardrop okay very good metal that's fine lovely and the the the, the i can the the acetabular uh, source cell is, is more than 10 degrees or i can say it's uh, but so what angle are you are you very very inclined yeah you're talking very well so i am yeah. imagining the, the the source cell the acetabular source cell or the uh, the roof acetabular mm. roof angle yeah look, okay very good excellent so very impressed so for everyone i've Try to cover the fibrillar part to give you all the options. And now I'm trying to tell you what I'll talk about in the acetabular part. So Metwali, very correct. The first thing you can tell people or say that there is definite, the, you know, you said superior and then you weren't sure what word to use. So Metwali, I would particularly say there's definite superior lip destruction. Are you happy to use that statement? Superior lip of the acetabular destruction? Metwali? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yes. And then you will say this means there's definite superior migration of the femoral head, right? So make that statement. Then say that the acetabular angle has definitely increased, right? Forget about yes. uh, talking about anything. Just all you want to see is the acetabular angle. If I ask you how to draw it, it's the angle at the low end of the teardrop and another line going to the where the acetabular finishes. Yes? yes. And what are the values? Do you know the value of that? The normal value is 35, mm -hmm. but as you go more inclined, do you agree? As you go more upwards, so more and more destruction here, you agree your angle is going more and more upwards. So that's above 45 is considered you know, as an issue, right? Yes. Now, once again, do you agree that this is not a barn door person who was born with dysplasia? Do you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. So this is not a true DDH in a young girl who's, and why do I say that? That most DDHs, would have the femoral head nice and round, but it'll be lying somewhere here and there. So all these crew classifications of DDH, try not to use when there's actually a superior lip destruction. You get my point, Pervin, that one? Yeah? Yes. That this is dysplastic, I agree. You can use the word dysplastic, but it's dysplastic because there's superior lip destruction. It's not dysplastic where the patient was born with it, right? Yes, Correct? Yeah. So there's a subtle difference. So that's the first thing to tell you. Just talk about the astral angle. So once you finish the angle, so what are the, you're going to start by superior lip destruction. You're going to talk about the angle. Then you're going to say, can you visualize your deer drop or not, Metwal? Just say, yes, I can, right? You can yes, see the I word. Can, I, can, I can see on both sides, yes. But it's... Yes. So what does that mean? That means you're indirectly telling me that the flow of the astroblem is satisfactory. Is that right? That gives me good information that I'm, I'm happy. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So, so that's your next statement you'll make. And then you'll say, I like to draw, which lines will you like to draw? Like what line is this? And then what line is, is this? So what line is this first? The iliopectineal line and the ilioischial line. Right. So what does the iliopectineal line give me information on? The iliopectineal represents the anterior column of the stabulum and the ilioischial line represents the posterior column. Exactly. So wherever you want to remember the way I remember it, is iliopectineal or iliopubic, yeah, will be the opposite of P. So it is the anterior wall, right? So yes. the opposite of P is the anterior wall. And the ilioischial gives me information about the, and it's not, not wall, it's the columns, yeah. So do you agree, at least looking at this, do you agree the anterior column is intact? Which one? Yeah, both, both column looks intact. In the yeah, so you see how much information you're getting. And you can say this, yeah. So now coming down to the management is how will I manage this? So how will you manage this? Uh, sorry, we'll give it to, uh, so uh, Shwan, because I probably have a, four, can we call the third, is there a third candidate or should I finish with Metwal? I'm afraid there isn't a third candidate. Yeah, so Metwali, do you mind if I, just for discussion? Yes, yes. Okay. How, yes will you, how will you manage this? So. How will you manage this patient? You've I described it very well. I'm very impressed. I will take the history and then examine the patient. Then uh, my aim in this case is to restore the hip center of rotation and mm -hmm. to do and equalize the hip, the leg length, describe, equalize the leg length. 
Yeah. And restore the femoral offset. Yeah. Very nice. With Excellent augmentation. Answer. And how are you going to do grafting. that? I need to also to augment the, uh, the asteroid defect on both sides with a yeah. little bone graft. So what you're going to get the hip centered down. So now do you agree yes. that Hani, if anyone before that, you know, when the person asked, will you use a jumbo cup? I know they didn't mean it in this, but using a large jumbo cup here is not right. You need to get your hip center back here, right? So Metwali, you're going to get your hip center down. And then this defect here, you're going to cover with what? What is your choice? What are your three choices and what will you use? The best option is to use bone graft. I would reconstruct this with bone graft. What bone graft? Now, because you've talked so well I, and you I, do, yeah. I, I will, I will autogenous bone graft from mm -hmm. the resected femoral heads. If it's not enough, I have to prepare all, uh, allogenic bone graft. Do you think this head will give you anything or is it in your head at all? Nothing, right? So you'll have to get a autogenous, but will you use impaction bone grafting or are you going to use a structural bone graft? I will because use a structural, a structural bone graft and I will fix it by screws or mesh. Fantastic. Okay. So Metwali, that's excellent. So just to, you know, you said, you said you use screws and then you said mesh. Just to make everyone clear that once you recreate and get your hip center right, everyone, so whether you put your cup there, you'll have a defect here. And this defect, first of all, the, you agree it's an uncontained defect, everyone. So from principles point of view, this is the uncontained defect. So the first thing to get a 708, you'll say, I'd like to convert this into a contained defect. And one way of doing that is use a mesh and I will use impaction bone grafting. So mesh and impaction bone grafting go together as one statement, right? Yeah, so that's one. The yeah. other way of doing it, there's no right or wrong, there are different ways hip surgeons do, but you need to know the principles, is that this defect, I will use a structural bone graft and fix it with screws, right? That one, like you want it. And the third, I will use yes, a exactly. trabecular metal augment. And just so you finish, I think I'll finish with what I did. So just to know is you agree now, I got my cup, you agree the cup is where it meant to be. And what have I used, Metwali? Suppose I show you this x-ray as a partial, what do you say you see? I ex Yeah, this is, this, this, it was mesh and the impaction yeah. bone graft with, cement, with cemented cup on impact bone graft on mesh, yes. Exactly. And, but before you started, Metwali would have a nice to say that on the femoral side, I don't see any problem. I will use my default stem. You agree that also makes the examiner feel that you're not worried about the femur. Then say the complexities on the astabular side. And I, you say what you said, and this is what I did. Yeah. So that if you show the exam, you'll say, I noticed this mesh, there's impaction bone grafting behind the mesh. So just to finish for everyone, just to give you an example, uh, Shwana Hani, and give you just one minute. You agree if you're shown this x-ray, everyone will say that the word I would use is this is a classical osteoarthritis of the left hip. Start by saying this is a femur. Do you agree now that is completely wrong? You're going to say that my foramen are not equal. It's not centered correctly. Then you're going to say the classical, uh, the, the, the what I see is a hip arthritis with the sphericity of the head being maintained. The neck appears satisfactory. The neck shaft angle appears satisfactory and the shaft up and the protracting area was appears satisfactory. Imagine if you're showing this. Do you agree in this one? You'll say there's destruction of the femoral head with superior migration, with superior lip destruction. Yeah. Imagine what you'll say for this one. Do you agree for this one? You'll say that I noticed there's a head, which is, what do you want to call it? You can see a misshapen head, everyone. You, you agree that you cannot see the difference between the cup and the acetabulum. So you'll agree this is an ankylosed metwally. Yeah. And so what is my complexity here is going to, and you agree now that is, there's no patency of the canal, everyone, right? You see the example? You'll agree that is a deformity in the subtrock area. So once you know what you're talking about, this is not going to phase you. So you'll say all these things is a misshapen head. There's ankylosis of the joint. There's a subtrochantric, intertrochantric deformity. There's no patency of the canal. And on the cup side, well, I don't think the cup was an issue. Imagine on this one, very easy to say. What are you going to say? Yes, Coxa, Magna, happy with everyone? Yeah, yeah. But you'll also talk about the acid here. But you'll say, my femur appears satisfactory. 
you know, so you got talking with sense. And this one, you agree? Osteotic changes, very short neck, previous osteotomy. And this one, you're going to say protuso, yeah? How are you going to say it? You agree that the head and femur is beyond your ischioilia line, right? So, so, so that's how we'll finish, yeah? Okay, so thank you. This is what I did for one of them. This is there. This is the difficult one. Remember the one which you can get right. The cup is straightforward, but your canal, see the canal? That's where you have to struggle. So my complexity, why I took two and a half or three hours to do it, would be the complexity on the femoral side. Yeah? Okay, and thank you. So I'll end there. Sorry, I overran Shwanahan. No, uh, very thank you very much for the talk. It's uh, as always, um, and uh, your structured way of uh, answering the questions is, I think, quite important uh, for our candidates to uh, learn. So I do recommend uh, re reviewing this uh, video when we put it up on our YouTube channel because I I end up I sometimes go over these videos, especially from Mr. Mah Mahlamik's Mahlamik's um on the basis that. Essentially, he has the perfect structure for the answers. Um, thank you so much. Um, okay, everyone. Um, once again, thank you. This was a joint session of OIU.